okay, okay, get this. My fiancé, well, him and his family are demanding a prenup, right? Okay, it took me a while to agree because I don't think it's okay, but I did it. Well, he now gets to meet my parents. He finally gets to see where I grew up, and, well, once he realized I'm so much more wealthy than his family, all of a sudden he wants to cancel the prenup. Well, too bad, bud. I met George five years ago at a party in college. We immediately hit it off and began hanging out in between classes. While our academic interests could not be more different, he majored in business while I studied chemistry. And our hobbies and senses of humor aligned perfectly. Back then, money didn't matter to us as long as we were happy and we were together. In the years that followed, as we grew closer, George took me on surprise vacation to Tahiti and proposed. I said yes, of course. But that only opened the doorway to a whole new range of problems. I'd met his parents once before when we first started dating. And although our interaction was brief, I had a clear impression that neither of them liked me. They lived in a manor house in the countryside surrounded by 20 acres of private land. I knew George was wealthy before, but never to this extreme. To him, this was just his childhood house, and, well, he knew no different. Strictly the opposite. I kept my family life quite private from my friends. At the request of my parents for reasons I'll explain later, I guess, in the end, his family fortunes what caused the conflict between his parents and me. Well, I still remember when he first told them the news. He said he's never seen them more horrified in his life, which I thought was quite fitting for how much they disliked it. Nevertheless, this wedding was going to happen, with or without their approval, so they had to get on board with the idea if they wanted invites. We spent an excessively long time stressing over every minor detail of the preparation, visiting a number of venues within our modest budget locally. We then had to decide on the theme of the wedding, who to invite, where to sit them, what food to serve, and the wedding dress itself. And then two weeks after we picked a place, we got a horrible call to say that they had to cancel our reservation due to construction repair. In the end... We had to step away when it became a little too much to juggle. All at once, settling for a slower and more relaxed approach, which let us keep a grip of our sanity. For now. This included our particular bachelor and bachelorette parties. The details of which we decisively kept secret from each other after the fact. For the final and arguably most important shopping item left to get... I took my mother and closest friends into the city to browse the shops for a wedding dress. I must have tried on at least 30 different dresses throughout the day before settling on having one custom made. After some little pushes of encouragement, when I returned home that evening, my fiancé wasn't home but had left a note on the fridge to say he was on a similar mission with his friends. So I happily waited for him to return. Well, it now became more exciting than stressful, with our playful secrets and day trips out making it less of a chore each time. We even took some time off work to carry on with our plans because we found that weekends were too short for everything we needed to do. My fiancé usually visits his parents every other weekend, and I would use this time to visit my own parents or see college friends. This time, however, I was shocked to be awarded to an invite, as well as apparently they had something they wanted to discuss with both of us present. As we pulled into the mile-long driveway and approached the house in the distance, I was reminded of an old nickname I had for the place. Misery Manor! Based on the cold reception I'd first received here, their housekeeper opened the door and took us to the upper living room where his parents stood at the window. After some light pleasantries, something so unusual for them, it made me both suspicious and queasy. They got right down to business. Ringing a small brass bell on the side of a table entered a man in the room, who they introduced as the family lawyer. Taking out papers from his briefcase, he started to explain legal proceedings around weddings and divorce. 
In his speech, he was very particular with his phrasing, giving out the particular divorce statistics and how many of those divorcees end up in the courtroom scraps over the finances. Cutting to the meat of the subject, the fiancé's father butts into the first mention of the dreaded word, prenup. Taking a form from his lawyer, he placed it on the table between us and pushed it across us to look at. They were so confident in the idea that they had just about finished the form already, only requiring our actual signatures to make it official. Talk about eagerness. I wasn't only mortified, I was annoyed that his parents would try running such a strong smear campaign against me. To my face, nonetheless. Suggesting that if we ever grew apart, I would try to make my fiancé for everything he had. Like some cheap gold digger. Wrapped up in my own feelings, I failed to notice my fiancé sat next to me who, on the other hand, looked quite concerned and thoughtful about the idea. It was strange for once to be at the polar opposite about opinions. Not sharing that same frustration, but he actually seemed to agree on what they were saying. Maybe. Eh, just maybe, they're right. I'm not saying it would happen, but wouldn't it be better to have this just in case, just like car insurance? Well, when he said that, he made the room chuckle. Ah, exactly right, my boy. You wouldn't wait until your car was stolen to get insurance, would you? His mother said, pointed at me. I shrugged non-committedly, explaining my hesitation despite their protest and dogged persistence. After what felt like an hour of hardcore interrogations, by a trio of bad cop routines made worse by the less harsh but still serious nudging of George, I agreed to sign it after sleeping on the idea. While it meant I was safe to leave without signing it right now, this seemed to pacify them enough to drop the issue. With that out the way, the conversation quickly shifted into a casual small talk. The sort I imagined took place in my absence as I realized no one paid any attention to me. Excusing myself, I decided to leave the room, and after navigating the labyrinth of hallways, I found a bathroom to hide in for a little bit. Determined not to show the vultures any sign of weakness while I sobbed weakly from the experience, I still did not like the idea of it, but it would make my fiancé happy. Well, fine. I was determined to show him what a bad idea it was later, though. According to him, I spent the rest of the day moody, but I suppose that just shows what little he understood about my feelings on the subject. Regardless, the last thing I wanted to do was let his parents talk about divorce, actually to drive us apart, so I perked up and moved on from it. The next day, I get a call early in the morning from my parents saying that they had a surprise for us that they could come over later to discuss it. I was confused, but excited. Two hours later, we were on the road, taking my fiancé to see my parents' house for the first time. He's met them before, but as they're very private people, they had always preferred just to meet at my house before or maybe a nearby restaurant. I bet he thought that they were a pair of goofballs living in the middle of nowhere. Well, he has a big surprise in store for him. Leaving civilization behind, he passed through the national park and entered a secluded forest on the edge of the country. I saw his face shift from curiosity to concern, as I bet he wondered how quickly we could get lost out here. Luckily for him, this was very familiar territory for me. Turning down a steep slope, we entered a large clearing where my parents' mansion resided. Ah, my childhood home. He sat with wide eyes and an open jaw for the rest of the journey until we pulled up alongside the front door. Turning slowly to me when we stopped with the most confused expression I had ever seen him have. I haven't even told him much about my parents before. I didn't feel like I needed to. I earned my money my way, and unlike him, I did not depend much on the family finances. Greeted by my loving mother and father at the tour, they welcomed us in and gave George the full tour of the property. After directing us to the patio in the backyard, we enjoyed a specially prepared lunch by the in-house cook. 
The weather was sunny. Still no clouds in the air to get rid of the blue sky overhead. Then from my father's pocket, I produced an envelope and handed it over to us with a bated breath. I was stunned as I completely forgot about their surprise. Carefully opening it between us, we found it was a small brochure for a vacation resort in Tahiti. Pouring over each page curiously. I left George engrossed in the pages while I looked up to my parents. Noticing my blankness, they explained further. Ah, we heard your wedding venue canceled, honey. My mother said softly. So, this is your new one, our wedding present. It took a moment for the words to sink in, but then we were overjoyed. My parents booked the Tahiti Resort as well as covered travel and accommodation for our guest, along with the complimentary week's vacation for, well, everyone. It was unreal. It wasn't until our drive home that I reminded him of the prenup, cutting his state of childlike wonder short with a dramatic change of heart he now proceeded to beg me to cancel the agreement realizing only too late that he had nothing to worry about. With smug satisfaction, I threw back his own advice in his face and refused, suggesting to best keep at, at least it'll make your parents happy, maybe they're right, you know. <laughs> well, he sulked for a while after realizing what a terrible idea the prenup actually was. Initially, he even blamed me for allegedly deceiving him, but after much correction, I helped to remind him whose idea it was in the first place. Christ, they even brought their lawyer in to give a dang speech about it as well. The realization seemed to open a floodgate in my fiancé as his life flashed before his eyes. Now recognizing their behavior across the years to be less loving and more manipulative than we thought. I don't blame him for not seeing it. Who would want to see their parents as evil or uncaring, even if they were? So I asked him, then to do something I knew would be hard despite the recent revelation. Take them off the wedding guest, honey. In theory, it was not hard to do as no one yet knew about the wonderful new venue, but he knew he'd be unable to keep it from them without a clear reason. That would also mean confronting them and having an argument for sure, which I was only too happy to help with, but it had to be him to say no, otherwise they simply would not listen. With a deep sigh, and he took the cell phone from his pocket and walked into the yard. I waited from the window and waved with a silent support at his mission. While I heard no words of this conversation from the changes in his expression, I could follow it with decent accuracy. He told them no, and they asked why. He explained why, and they blame me. He defends me, and they get angry. It was a cycle I was all too familiar with. As time went on, it looked like George was getting no further to calming down his parents, so he ended up hanging up over the call after a quick goodbye. He shuffled back into the house, looking deflated and miserable, doubting whether he's done anything right. I gave him some much-needed validation and reassurance, and our wedding was about us, not his parents. They would not die if they missed this. Probably. Well, but either way, this is what we decided to do together, and it was my job to make sure he did not get soft and change his mind before the big day. Three weeks later, we rose to the ungodly hour of 4 a.m., just to pack our bags and get a cab over the airport for the final leg of the marital journey. Two flights and 15 hours later, we landed in the tropical paradise known as Tahiti. My parents were already there along with a few close friends, who got there early to start getting everything ready ahead of the ceremony. Luckily, this also meant that George and I had less than we needed to know, giving us little time for rest and relaxation to combat the fierce jet lag, we did stop that and help a little bit in the evening where there was still a bucket load of tasks to finish before the rest of the masses showed up. Everything was perfect. It was like a postcard, and so much better than the first venue we tried to book. I fell into a bed at 8 that evening after an exhausting day and a delicious dinner. The next morning, I got up to 6 to watch the sunrise over the tranquil waters. 
joined later by my mother and bridesmaids. Whether my fiancé had a lie-in or not, I don't know. He was usually a heavy sleeper, but who could sleep at a time like this? As the sun rose, so did the rest of the staff and guests who made, well, arrived us on time sometime into the night, while others came by cab or bus throughout the day. And then the place was abuzz with activity. For the sake of those catching late flights or needing rest after their long trip, we scheduled the wedding to start at dusk, giving everybody plenty of time for both, hopefully. Skipping the minor details, we then started the ceremony itself, which was held on a beach nearby the venue. The perfect backdrop to the perfect day. The procession went without a hitch. It was a little sad that in front row still had a few empty chairs and reserved for his family, but I hope it didn't weigh on his mind too much. Then after some tear-jerking moments, we were officially, finally, husband and wife. Moving back to the venue, we began the celebrations with a five-course dinner and bottomless cocktails for our very enthusiastic attendees. With that seemed like the serious part, it's out the way now, and all that was left was to enjoy it to the fullest. After dinner, I noticed that my handbag had been slowly moving across the table. Picking it up, I realized it was my cell phone that was furiously buzzing a tone demanding attention. Turning on the screen, I saw it was from my husband's parents, along with five other missed calls. Stepping out into a quieter hallway, I listened to a voicemail to find a, well, full-blown angry jealous rant about the wedding and me personally. I deleted the other voicemails and expected much of the same, and then, back in the main hall, I snuck away to my husband's phone. It looked like he had also had a few missed calls and text messages, except this time it was focused on apologies rather than insults. Go figure. I decide to turn both off and leave them in our room. That way, they won't be able to ruin this evening the way that they tried to ruin mine. They were not here, and calling us now to apologize was far too late. So, I want to ask you guys. Am I the a-hole for not inviting my manipulative in-laws at our wedding? Please let me know in the comment section down below. Update number one. The wedding was fantastic with the little drama, surprisingly. My parents helped take the weight of responsibility and organization so that we could kick back and relax, a little despite the stress of it all. I was very thankful that I encouraged my partner, now husband, to take his parents off the guest list. Well, while I understand it may have been a painful thing to do, I could imagine they were probably the type of person to object to the marriage at the end of it anyways and cause a huge scene like a soap opera. The venue was as amazing as my parents said, and the weather could not have been better. It made the wedding a tropical paradise that guests wish could last forever. While we slash I splurged on the trip to make sure our guests enjoyed it, we did also give ourselves an extra week away for our honeymoon road trip. Over the course of our extra week, we went to a very variety of tourist hot spots, tried many wonderful cocktails, and had no contact with anybody back home. Our professional photographers processed and uploaded the pictures for us onto social media, which we browsed for a little bit before we started to get bombarded with posts and messages from jealous and curious friends. Sadly, this also included his parents, who we still pointedly ignored. Despite our stubborn silence, they continued their attempts to contact us directly, leaving numerous voicemails destined to be deleted immediately. Well, it was sad that we had to say goodbye to our extended stay, but we had to leave eventually, so at least you could say we made the most of it. We may have also been planning our second short vacation in the near future. A series of long connecting flights later, we finally arrived at my parents' house mid-afternoon and overcame jet lag and fatigue. We crashed until the next morning. My father kindly offered to pick up from the nearby airport, knowing the house my husband gladly accepted it as a semi-vacation in itself to not have to drive the way. 
We turned our cell phones back on after the flight and noticed he had another missed call from his parents, but left it to deal with it just tomorrow. Sometime in the early hours of the next morning, we were rudely awoken by shouting outside our bedroom window. Sneaking a peek between the blinds, I noticed it was the in-laws, who had somehow found my parents' house and now proceeded to give themselves a tour. I shook him awake and explained the problem, quickly getting modest before going down to greet them. It looked like my parents were still asleep, and I hope they stayed that way until I've gotten rid of these, well, pests. We found them staring with wonder at the heated pool in the backyard. Closing the door behind us so they didn't confuse it with an open invitation. Upon noticing me, I expected a scowl or at least a grunt of disgust. Instead, after a quick and calculating second, they seemed to worship me as much as they did their own son. They stubbornly apologized for their previous behavior and begged us to forgive them even offering to help get rid of the prenup as in their words, and I quote, Oh, honey, you never did want that anyways, right? What good is a silly bit of paper anyhow? With a uh, kind of fake laughter after that. From previous calls and text, I just assumed that they had seen all the wedding pictures, yet strangely did not bring up the topic once, even though they must have still felt a bit disappointed or angry about being left out. What are you doing here? We came to see you both, of course. Wanted to congratulate a happy couple. Uh, my husband and I exchanged uneasy glances. Okay, but here. How did you find us here? He pressed the question again, and his mother turned to him and pulled out her cell phone, pointing to a map on it that displayed his location. He erupted with absolute rage when he realized what it was. His parents had bugged his cell phone sometime before the wedding to keep a track of him. Now it's their turn to try to calm the situation, as we're equally furious about their ambush and new controlling tactics. Pulling my husband by the hand, I opened the back door and attempted to shut them out. Instead, they managed to annoyingly push their way in and proceed to continue the tour before our interruption. Well, chasing after them, I threatened to call security, but they ignored me and continued to look around. Reaching the emergency button under the kitchen counter, I alerted my family's on-site private security and just waited at the door for the arrival. With their help, we were able to stop his parents and escort them back outside. Softly pushing them towards the door, my husband assured them they could talk again later, even though I could see from his eyes how sick of them he'd started to get. If we had simply thrown them out the door, they would have stayed like nosy tourists, so I instructed them to be returning to their car and shown off the premises by, and I quote, whatever force necessary. Though, I whispered that part when my husband was distracted. What followed ended up not being too hard of a conversation, but it's one I was very glad we had. Unanimously, we agreed on it best. Just for us to at least cut them out of our lives! Update number three. Hey guys, while many people may consider it sad to cut ties with such close relatives sad, especially with their growing fortune and declining health, even, well, then neither of us felt like their money was worth it. After our studies, we had both grown and succeeded in our respective academic fields, and that was important because we did it. We succeeded by ourselves, and we managed independently. Deciding against the hassle of arguing our case in person, especially since the first attempt did not go so well. My husband called them to give them the bad news. A few seconds later, he looked relieved when he only got through to their answering machine, hanging up without even leaving a message. Not wishing to be overtly cruel in delivery, we agreed to handwrite a letter rather than leaving it on voicemail, hoping it'd soften the blow if we could properly put our feelings on the paper. What followed that evening was a call back from which we received a massive backlash of anger and outrage, rather than the expected shock or sadness we first intentioned. 
they were furious. That he would turn his back on his family, but found room to blame me for everything as well. It's nice to always be included sometimes. Luckily, we were both at the same opinions on the matter and our minds were made up, with no room left for negotiation. So when the conversation dragged on after another 20 minutes, we had no issue putting down the phone to cut off their hateful rant. When our cell phones continued to ring, we promptly pulled the plug on the phone for the rest of the night to give them time to calm down and adjust to their new reality. Update for final update. While we hoped after the first week of blissful silence that would be the end of it, maybe his parents had finally decided we weren't worth the trouble and had reasonably agreed to give us our space. Oh, no. Not at all. As if purposefully designed to catch us by surprise. We were at dinner one night hosting a few friends when we had heard a knock on the door. Thinking nothing strange of it, at first I went to go see if I was expecting a parcel today. I regretted my decision before the door even finished opening, because instead, my in-laws had decided to pay us another visit. At first, his mother led the conversation, trying to keep a level head, while the man next to her seemed to be the building in frustration internally like a nuclear reactor. When I refused them entry to talk to their son, they made the executive decision to push past me and storm into the hallway, calling out for my husband. So my husband rushed over to stop them in the hallway, preventing them from bringing our friends into, well, petty family drama. As if by the flick of a switch, the rage swapped to pleading when they saw him, trying anything they could have thought of to get his good side. I beckoned my husband to the front door, and we left the conversation back out to the front yard, where we could shut the door if the party refused to talk amicably. Amidst the finger-wagging and heated debate on their rights, our rights, good choices, and the future, the only thing we could agree upon is that we all loved my husband, so fatally the decision and the blame fell to him. Seeing as this was something we could not settle, well, we had to let his parents back in and apologize to our friends for ending the dinner party early. Who I expected was keen to hear more, but happily left when asked. I wished his parents shared that same courtesy. My husband left us in the living room, uh, saying he needed time to think alone, giving me the painful chore of keeping his parents entertained or at least satisfied enough that they did not tear me apart for his absence. Luckily for me... Their outburst earlier seemed to have exhausted them to the point they could only manage icy glares across the room instead, which I had no problem ignoring while pretending to look through my cell phone. Half an hour later, he returned and caught their attention again. Sitting upright with newfound energy, he chose his words carefully but ultimately sided with me in favor of keeping them far, far away. A somber last resort, he even mentioned legal action and restraining orders if they tried to turn up to the house again without asking. He opened the front door and forced them out afterwards as they stumbled away dejected. Hopefully, now, this will truly be the last we ever have to hear from them. Alright, alright, so this one ended basically how I thought it was going to end. But maybe you guys thought differently, didn't see some red flags or what it was, but to me, it was just increasingly obvious that, hey, fiancé's parents are so toxic, and straight up, you guys need to go ahead and cut that contact right away. So, towards the end of the story, it looked like OP and her fiancé, well, husband, decides to cut contacts and relations with his side of the family. I would like to hear from you guys if you think that was harsh, maybe a little too soon, or the bad move altogether. Drop your opinions down below, let's talk about it as always. I always try to respond to most of the comments that I read, so drop your thoughts down below and let's talk about it. Guys, if you're new to the channel, my name is Mr. Redito. I narrate stories every single day. This is not my only channel. You can find my other channels directly below in the description. I also animate stories, so check that out on Mr. Redito Animated. Alright guys, have a fantastic day. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, peace.